Hey, hey, today is episode 65 with Dr. B. Welcome to the Living Beyond ADHD podcast. If you're looking for a fresh perspective and actionable steps on hot topics from focus to follow through to self-management and more, you are in the right place. Welcome your host, innovative educator, coach, and psychotherapist, Dr. B. Hey, DDers. So glad that you could join me for today's episode about getting organized the fun way. If you're like other adults with ADHD or underdeveloped executive function skills, you might be thinking, no way can getting organized be fun. And then there's the maintenance after you get organized so that you can stay that way. You know, it's the number one issue that many of you voted on in my Facebook group and said that you dread, that you procrastinate on, and that you hate to do it. That's pretty powerful. I get it. I made sure to include fun in this episode because I learned long ago that I need to create games out of pretty much everything that I do so that it's fun and I look forward to it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So whether it's beat the clock or making a movie out of a project or taking on the role of someone who does a task really well or dressing up in something that's fun, I think of ways to make it fun for myself so there's no procrastination and no resistance. And I would love for you to feel the same way about getting yourselves organized the fun way. Have you ever thought, What's so great about being organized and staying that way? I have, and for me, it's that I can find anything that I need whenever I need it, and I don't have to go on the hunt. I really dislike the hunt, and I trust you can relate to the hunt. Everything in my space has a home, goes back home every night before I go to sleep, and I call that game curfew. I had a curfew as a teenager, and I figured that my stuff could have a curfew too. I also enjoy the aesthetics of being organized. What my spice cabinet looks like is visually pleasing to me, and it's organized in a way that I can see everything without needing to move anything around. You know, I'm curious, what keeps getting organized from being fun for you? From what I've seen over the years, it could be the feeling of misery. Seriously. The dictionary defines misery as a serious lack of contentment or happiness. That something is causing extreme suffering or unhappiness. I read a powerful little book years ago called Addicted to Misery by Robert Becker. He gets straight to the point for those of us who have lived with extreme unhappiness for so long and are used to it, and we fear letting go of it to replace it with something entirely new, happiness. As it relates to today's episode, happiness while you're getting organized and happiness while you're maintaining your organized ways, seriously, stay with me on this. Whether the source of your underlying misery or unhappiness is due to your symptoms of ADHD, underdeveloped executive function skills, depression, anxiety, trauma, or various addictions like sugar, social media, shopping, sex, food, relationships, and more, these can all serve to fuel your unhappiness, even though that's probably not why you're pursuing them. Going deeper, being addicted to misery is familiar. It's safe, it's comfortable, even though it can be horribly painful or embarrassing at times. You might actually find yourself bringing misery into your life because you need that familiar feeling of unhappiness. An example of being addicted to misery could be living in a space of clutter and disarray. You know you hate it, You swear that you're going to clean up your space, get it organized, and then maintain it every single day, yet it keeps returning to the same cluttered space that you hate. Imagine for a moment what you might feel like 
if you are able to maintain your organized space and clutter was no longer an issue in your life. So many of us long for that to happen, and yet it's a way of living that's foreign to us. We've grown up with shame about ourselves and how we live, how we live our lives, and this is the proof of our shameful reality. This is our misery, and it lives on day after day after day. So what would you do with your freed up time and thoughts and feelings if you weren't constantly thinking about how bad your disorganization is or how inadequate you feel when you can't seem to maintain organization for even a few days? What's wrong with you, you might ask? Nothing is wrong with you. What's wrong is that getting organized and staying that way probably isn't fun and isn't your automatic way of living. Remember, we're feeling-driven people, and we need to feel excited or positively stimulated about doing things for them to happen. Do you feel that way about getting organized? Probably not. In the 1970s, I studied hypnosis and the theory of the mind. We were taught that about 10% of our mind's capacity is conscious, meaning only 10% is actively engaged in thinking, logic, reason, and willpower. This is the part of your mind that you've been using to learn how to get organized and stay that way. 10%, that's not much at all. The other 90% is actively engaged in identifying and associating and reacting to what's already stored in your subconscious mind. That's a lot of mind capacity that could be working against you, depending on what's been stored in your subconscious mind. Have you ever wondered why you get triggered so easily by things in the present time, like getting organized, when they don't seem like they're a big deal? It's because the events of today are getting amped up by the meaning that you gave those events in the past, and it's the meaning that's raising the level of intensity or resistance that you're experiencing. Remember, you are the meaning maker of your life. You spin the stories, meanings, reasons, justifications, and logic that drive your life on autopilot. And updating what's stored in your autopilot mind space can make all the difference in the quality of your life and your ability to get things done, such as getting organized and having fun while you're doing it. So, what does it take to cut ties with misery and embrace a life of being happier and organized inside and out? The short answer is cultivating a healthier relationship with yourself than you probably currently have. The definition of codependency that I learned years ago was an absence of a healthy relationship with self. This means that we all need to learn what makes us happier and what our unique needs are, not just knowing about others and meeting their needs and ignoring our own. That is definitely a path to misery. No matter what the organizational expectations are of your adult life, it's up to you to shift the meanings that you've given things so that the autopilot part of your mind supports you rather than resists and push back against your efforts. I'll be talking about this in more detail and giving you steps to take further on in this episode. And one more thing. I want to cover before we shift gears here, and that is organizing takes place outside your head, not inside. You need to see what you're organizing, make it tangible and real so that you can work with it, move it around, adjust it, and finalize its flow. You can't see your thoughts inside your head and get them organized. You need to see them or hear them outside your mind so that you can work with them. In other words, you need to free up your mind space so that you have room to process and organize information 
as well as make a plan to organize things in your outer world. Stay with me for more on this and steps to take further on in this episode. This podcast is sponsored by Pure Potential with Dr. B. You can head over to drbarbaracohen.com and find the podcast transcript. Great free content, plus information on programs and services, including the groundbreaking Adventures in Achievement Online Coaching Program and one-to-one services with Dr. B. That's drbarbaracohen.com. Today's episode is about recovering from the pain, needless suffering, and misunderstandings of what it takes to get organized and stay that way, both inside your mind and outside in your environments, and three specific steps that you can take to get started now. You can do this. I know you can. And even though I'm talking about doing something rather than just being, remember, that you are not what you do or don't do, that you are more than that, much more than that. You're not the story you make up about yourself. You're not defective or less than as a person, as a human being because of being organized or disorganized. Remind yourself that your mind just works differently, not better, not worse, and that the difference is actually pretty cool Once you have a different perspective and the tools that you need for your own success, the fun way. Gotta be fun. And knowing is only the first step. The next step is taking action on what you know to start getting new results, better results, and fine-tune your progress as you go along. It's a process, so please don't let yourself off the hook here with taking action once not getting the results you hoped for, and stopping there. Seriously? Did you learn to speak fluently or dress yourself nicely with just one attempt? I know I didn't, so keep going. You're learning to do new things, and that takes practice, not just standing up and doing them like you've known how to do them your whole life. It's almost time for stories and steps, but first, let's celebrate a few wins. Perhaps you started an exercise routine. Awesome. Or maybe you've decided to accept yourself just as you are and then decide if you want to improve on anything that you do. Fantastic. Or maybe you made a decision to work on organizing your thoughts. Awesome. Celebrating a win today, even if it's been a really, really tough day, Let you acknowledge that at least something is good about today, and that's important even in the worst of times. You are a precious child of the universe and are called a human being, not a human doing, for good reason. You don't have to earn your value by what you do. You were born with it. Your value comes from who you are, not what you do. Got it? I hope so, because you're going to keep hearing me say it, because it's so important to your self-esteem and your quality of life. So let's transition now to cutting ties with misery and taking three fun steps to get started getting organized with relevant stories and, of course, a favorite quote of mine. How much time do we have? Not much. So let's get to it. Today's three fun steps are pausing for the fun of it in all that you do, the skill that keeps giving, letting go of shame or guilt, and returning to sender, and fun strategies for getting organized and seeing the organization outside of your mind so you can play with it. Now back to being an adult with ADHD in today's world. I'm going to share three fun stories with you today, as well as talk about your responsibility in this. That's right, response-ability, or your ability to respond. In this case, to create the fun for yourself. I hope at least one of these stories will resonate with you and be of benefit. Shifting gears to our first story, pausing for the fun of it in all that you do, the skill 
that keeps giving. Rushing is the enemy of productive action. I've shared this tip recently with my community in a deeper way, and it always hits home. Sally was typical of so many adults with ADHD or underdeveloped executive function skills. She worked long hours in a fast-paced company, had a challenging commute, and was exhausted when she got home every night. She didn't want to think about anything except just collapsing on the couch and catching her breath. Who cares where her keys or her phone went as she threw them somewhere as she walked in the door? They're somewhere in her apartment, that's all she knew, and she would find them the next time that she needed them, just not now. Sally grabbed her mail if the thought crossed her mind as she made her way to her upstairs apartment, and she typically threw the mail just like she threw her keys and her phone and whatever else that she had when she came in the door. She was exhausted and just didn't want to think about anything. She was becoming a bit of a recluse and didn't even want to talk to her friends when they would call her in the evening. It felt like an imposition on her time and her energy. And either she wouldn't answer or she would just be brief and get off the phone quickly. Not a great way to sustain healthy relationships. Sally just wasn't happy with her life, both in and out of work. In fact, she really wished that she could look for something else that was closer to home and less fast-paced, but where was she going to get the time or the energy to do that? Instead, she just accepted what she believed was her fate and lived her unhappy life day by day. Some background facts. Impulsivity has no pause. It's just reactive to what's happening in the moment or what you feel like doing or not doing. When you're exhausted, you don't have the mental or emotional capacity to make good choices. Having more fully developed skills of planning or even prioritizing would help Sally to conserve more of her energy for her personal life and not give it all away on the job. I would even allow her to carve out some sacred time to look for a position closer to home and more suited to her needs. Pausing seems counterintuitive when there's so much to be done that you feel like you just don't have any time and you have to keep moving because there's no time to waste. When someone asks you a question and wants an answer right away and your mind just shuts down in those moments, the pause is a lifesaver. Some of us don't do well with what is called demand language, even if it's expressed kindly. We need a little time to think about our answer before we give it, and the pause gives us that time that we need. If you relate to Sally's story, your action steps are focus on pausing for a moment when you walk in the door and you think about where your keys and phone and mail and other personal things need to go for you to have an easier time finding them later instead of just mindlessly tossing them as you walk through the doorway. Follow through on creating a fun little reminder note or a basket or a table or whatever appeals to you that's right there at the doorway when you walk in so you can just put your keys, phone, mail, and personal stuff right there every single time. Nothing else goes there except these things that come home from work with you every day. And instead of bringing the mail in, perhaps set up a recycling bag outside your space Sort the junk mail there before you enter the house. It's much easier to bring in only what you're going to need and not the junk stuff. And for self-management, resist the impulsive and emotional urges to just throw your things even though the basket or the table is right there. That's your autopilot mind taking over. Take a second to ask yourself, if not now, when? The mental pause will often give you the space that you need to do it right then and there. And if not, you've at least put a place marker in your headspace to make time for it later. Now, follow through and set an alarm reminder for yourself rather than feeling that you'll remember because you and I know that's not likely to happen. 
transitioning to our second story, letting go of shame or guilt and returning to sender. Shame is about you, a person who is defective. Guilt is about your behaviors, what you've done or not done. Sometimes the shame and or the guilt that we carry doesn't even belong to us. We took it on or we inherit it from our families of origin or somebody else. What's important here is it doesn't belong to you. Wayne was suffering from toxic shame. He was convinced that he was a horrible person and he didn't deserve to have a good life. He kept thinking about how all someone had to do was look at his environment with all the stacks of stuff that were everywhere or engage in a conversation with him and find it very, very difficult to track what he was trying to communicate to see the evidence that he was really a horrible person. He talked all about the plans that he had, like going back to college to complete his degree buying a little place of his own in the mountains to be close to nature, writing a book, starting a business, and so on. In actuality, he didn't have any plans for these things. He had dreams. No specifics, no steps, no plan of how he would achieve any of his dreams. Yet he referred to these things as what he planned to do in his life. Over the years, Wayne became more and more depressed because his life was not turning out the way he planned. This is what he was telling himself. He didn't realize that he didn't have actual plans for these things to come to fruition, and so they didn't. After a while, he gave up on making plans, or rather having dreams, because what was the point? He was disappointed and frustrated that life just wasn't going to work out for him and that planning or having plans was a total waste of time because they did not come true. Some background facts. You can't fix what isn't real and doesn't belong to you. Said another way, if the shame or the guilt that you're carrying belongs to somebody else, you can't fix those feelings and you can't heal the issues because they aren't yours. The best that you can do is return them to the person that they belong to, which I fondly refer to as return to sender. And it's not that I literally walk up to a person and say, here, this belongs to you. But I do a little imagery work where I release them. I kind of label them, see whose they are, and I return them to sender. You know, the autopilot part of us lives on in our subconscious mind, and it can sabotage our best efforts to get organized because there's some risk to them if we succeed. Continuing to fight to get organized might not be the solution here. Rather, to embrace and accept those parts of you that live in your subconscious mind with compassion and understanding so you can resolve whatever the issues are that stand in the way of them allowing you to get organized or do anything else that you really, really want to do in your life. As Jim Rohn so eloquently said, for things to change, you've got to change. As to what those changes need to be, it's different for every one of us. Once we identify what the driving force of our shame or guilt is, we can make a plan to transform that driving force and have it generate positive outcomes in our life, not disastrous ones. If you relate to Wayne's story, your action steps are focus on discovering what the underlying issue is that's stored in your subconscious mind and come to understand what's needed from you for healing. By focusing on what is needed, you can reduce your feelings of shame or guilt when you see your piles of stuff. And if what you uncover doesn't belong to you, then playing the game of return to sender is a great way to relieve yourself of issues that aren't yours and need to be set free so that you can focus on yours and heal. Follow through on healing your relationship with the parts of you that are hurting 
as you develop a more loving relationship with yourself and you slowly start to organize small areas, making sure that you pause if you feel any resistance arise or any pushback from within yourself. Pause long enough to check in with yourself to figure out what you need to do differently to make it okay to continue with your organization of that particular area. And self-management. Be sure to acknowledge whatever feelings arise rather than running from them while you're focusing on the underlying issues or parts of you and you're working on healing your relationship with yourself. Feelings are there for a reason, to communicate a message to you so that you can continue to move forward. So be gentle with yourself as you receive the message and seek to understand it. Shaming or guilting yourself is of absolute no benefit to your well-being. Transitioning to our third story. Fun strategies for getting organized inside and outside of your mind. Getting organized needs to take place outside your mind, not inside whether we're talking about your thoughts or your environment, because the more you can free up your mind space for processing information rather than storing it, the easier it's going to be for you to get yourself started with organizing. So a massive brain dump is in order here. That means getting everything that you've been ruminating about inside your mind, outside of you, and onto a whiteboard or post-its, or something where you can view it, step back from it and gain perspective on it, move things around on the surface and get it into a sequence or a flow that makes sense to you. And then you test it to see if it really works. Tammy had the ineffective habit of keeping everything she needed to do in her mind rather than in a calendar or a planner or even on a big sheet of paper on the wall in her living space. She prided herself on being able to remember everything that she needed to do, but one problem. She wasn't taking action on any of the things that she remembered that she needed to do, because trying to hold on to all of her responsibilities in her mind left very little mind space for thinking about the action steps of the tasks or the projects it was enough to just remember the tasks. And because Tammy didn't have any strategies for organizing her mind or her environment, what she ended up with was a lot on her plate that had to get done, which led to her feelings of overwhelm because nothing was getting done. We would often hear her say that if she just had less to think about, then she could make some headway. She just didn't know what steps to take to clear her mind so that she could. Some background facts. We are the meaning makers of our lives. We get to decide what something means or doesn't mean to us. So if your disorganization means something negative about you, rather than a skill set that you need to master, that moral judgment will definitely slow you down and get in your way. If you believe that organizing your thoughts or your environment is a tedious task and not worth the time or the effort it will take, then it, and it feels like a chore to you rather than something you want to do, then you're not going to do it. It's so important that the meaning that we give things empowers us to get into action rather than strapping us down into a frozen state. If you relate to Tammy's story, your fun action steps are as follows. Make a play date with yourself on your calendar for a specific amount of time and have it be a repeating event. Choose carefully so that you don't run into conflicts with other appointments that are on your planner. Keep this time absolutely sacred for you and your fun organizational dates. To manage any overwhelm that you might experience about getting your thoughts or your environment organized, you want to work in manageable chunks. One way that you can do that is with your environment is that you can use sheets, big bedding sheets, to cover up everything 
and reduce the visual stimulus that hits you every day. This isn't about denial. This isn't about hiding anything. It's simply to remove the visual stimulus. And then when it's time for your play date with yourself, see how much time you've given yourself and pull out only the amount of stuff for that amount of time that you're going to work with. Be curious, be excited to see your stuff again because you haven't seen it for a while and think about what its purpose is in your life, if there is one. And if not, you might need to consider releasing it. Perhaps you want to interview your things as you go through them. Talk aloud about your relationship with them, when they came into your life, why you chose them, what you need now in your life. And if they aren't what you need now, you might consider thanking your stuff for being in your life and serving you as it did for some time, maybe even years. But that time has come to an end and you need to say goodbye. It's important to express gratitude even to your stuff for what it's done for you over time. And I say that because it's a relationship that you have with your stuff. Be sure to use a timer when you start your play date so you don't overstay your time. I don't know if you've ever felt that someone overstayed his or her time when they were visiting. And if so, it doesn't feel good. And it won't feel good to you if you overstay your time with your stuff. You won't want to visit your stuff again and continue to organize it because it won't feel good and there's no clear boundary. So for focusing, focus only on spending the time that you've allotted for your play date. Follow through on making it fun by dressing up or playing a role or being curious or all of it. You want it to be interesting and engaging in the process of being with your stuff rather than looking at it with disgust or frustration. And self-management of your feelings about each of the things that you pull out from under the sheets and reflect on. If having a body double present with you while you're having these play dates is helpful, then by all means invite someone to just sit and be with you during these times if their presence might help to ground you and keep you out of overwhelm. A favorite quote of mine, Buddha said, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. The mind is everything. What we think, we become. The question I have for you at this point of our journey together is, do you understand just how powerful your mind is and how training it to be your faithful servant so to speak, is a gift to yourself that will last you a lifetime. Whether you're learning from my podcast episodes or live videos or working with me directly, you're in my world and I'm here to serve your needs. So be sure to reach out and get your needs met. It's up to you to take action here so that things can change for you. In the show notes, you'll find information about my upcoming free webinar that's happening this Sunday, November 10th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. The topic is three steps that you can take to start getting organized the fun way. I hope that you'll come prepared to having some fun together with me as we enter the world of getting organized without overwhelm or frustration. So, If you're feeling overwhelmed and lack the steps and the skills to get started with your organizational adventures, be sure to register and let's have some fun time together. You'll have the opportunity to share your challenges with me when you register, as well as what you're seeking as solutions. I really look forward to being together and knowing what would be most helpful to you. I appreciate you showing up to listen today and in the future. I'm making my way back to producing regular episodes. And as a subscriber, the newest episode will automatically be in your feed, which makes it really easy. If you enjoyed today's episode or any of the other episodes, please share this podcast show with your friends and family, as well as rate the show. If you'd like to do a little bit more, you can write a thoughtful review on iTunes or any of the other places you find my show so I can know that I'm meeting your needs. It doesn't have to be anything lengthy, just a line or two about how the podcast is helping you. 
If it is, I love hearing from you. It means a lot to me to know that your life is getting a little bit better every time we get together. Be sure to check out the show notes for more free content and ways that we can work together. I have solutions to the challenges that you're experiencing because I lived with those challenges too. I made my way out and I'd like to help you get out as well. I hope to see you this Sunday, November 10th at 5 p.m. Pacific time and read ahead of time what your challenges are and what you need. That is, of the, if that's of interest to you. Thanks for listening. Until the next time, bye for now. Thanks for your undivided attention. If you're eager to make positive changes in your life, head over to drbarbaracohen.com to see how Dr. B can help you today. Whether you love making changes with community support in a group environment or prefer one-to-one coaching or psychotherapy, you'll find all the information you need to get started at drbarbaracohen.com.